Welcome to Can Big Data Save the World, uh, the second debate in the battle over life and death strand that's running in this room throughout the day uh, and that's supported by the Wellcome Trust. For those of you who weren't at the previous debate in this strand, my name is Sandy Starr. I'm the producer of the strand and I work for the Progress Educational Trust. That's a charity that champions and explains and encourages debate about advances in genetics and assisted conception and embryo and stem cell research. Big data has been debated before at the Battle of Ideas. It's become a subject of ever greater prominence and debate in recent years, but today we're looking at a specific aspect of big data, namely its impact on development, the developing world, uh, and international relations. Much has been made of the ability of big data to inform all manner of decisions and policies and initiatives in the developing world and to help tackle natural disasters and humanitarian crises. Uh, and I'm sure we'll hear some examples of that. But at the same time, these claims for big data have been met with skepticism and caveats and criticism from some quarters. And I'm sure we'll be hearing some of that as well. So the question before us is, can big data save the world? Uh, we're not just looking for yes or no answers, that would make a rather brief and unsatisfying debate, but exploration of what this question might mean and why we think about big data the way we do and whether and how we should be thinking about it differently. And we're fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of speakers to tackle this question and I get the impression from talking to them uh, that they're not really yes, no answer type of people, which is good. In the order in which they're going to speak, first we have Timandra Harkness on my far right. Timandra has organised and chaired debates about big data at the Battle of Ideas the last two years uh, with me as a speaker. And I'm very pleased to turn the tables on her <laughs> and find out what she has to say. Timandra is a science writer and broadcaster, presenter of some very interesting BBC Radio 4 programmes that cover issues in big data, including uh, future proofing and data, data everywhere. And she's the author of the forthcoming book, Big Data Does Size Matter? Then we have Marie McIntyre on my immediate right, who's an epidemiologist and research associate at the University of Liverpool's Institute of Infection and Global Health. Uh, and Marie has been working on big data projects for several years now. Uh, and among other things, she is responsible for building the Enhanced Infectious Diseases Database, which is the most comprehensive database of human and animal pathogens in the world. Then we have Paul Jasper on my immediate left, who's a development economist and consultant at Oxford Policy Management. He's got extensive experience in data management, quantitative research, and statistical analysis. And he published an article recently entitled, Why We Shouldn't Get Too Excited About Using Big Data for Development. I have a line here in my notes about how if Tamandra and Marie excite us too much, Paul will be the man to calm us down. Funnily enough, <laughs> when we were chatting beforehand, they've been the ones with the caveats, and these two have been the most excited. So uh, they're not nearly as predictable as I thought. Um, and uh, last but not least, on my far left, spatially, and perhaps also politically, uh, we have Professor David Chandler, uh, Director of the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster, and author of so many books that if I were to list them, the session would be over. But uh, suffice to say, several of his books relate to the issues we're debating today, and he recently published a paper with a, the ominous title, uh, Big Data and the Coming Age of Post-Humanism. They're going to speak for a maximum of five minutes each in the first instance. I will keep them to time. And I'd remind anyone who's tweeting out there in the audience to please use the hashtag Battle of Ideas. So without any further ado, Tamandra, can you please tell us whether you think big data can save the world? In just five minutes. Yes. Uh, well, I'm going to be... Because I'm on first and because, although you're obviously self-selecting, so I'm sure you all are very familiar with the idea of big data, but nevertheless, a lot of people do say to me, what is big data or even what is data? So I'm going to attempt to test on you a backronym that I have created myself. Uh, as you all know, it's a reverse engineered acronym. Uh, and try and throw up what I think is some key ideas in the course of that. So what is, what is big data? Uh, well, first of all, it's big. And this, well, this is in some sense a moving target. I was looking at a, a very seminal paper on big data from about 10 years ago, which spoke in awed tones of uh, thousands of terabytes of data and how enormous this was. And I have, a, I have a portable hard drive at home that's about the size of my mobile phone that, that holds a terabyte of data. Everything I have is backed up onto it. So what was big in terms of volume 
uh, even a year ago is now is now small fry. Uh, there was a very irreverent uh, definition, which is big data is just slightly bigger than the computer facilities you have at your disposal, which uh, which I think is is reasonably true. So in terms of sheer size, I think. Yes, it's bigger every year, but in a sense that's meaningless because it, it's a constantly growing thing and our capacity to deal with it is constantly growing. Uh, what's perhaps more interesting is the completeness, the sense that you get not just a sample of data, you actually get a complete set of all the data. So instead of stopping people with surveys on the tube to ask them what journeys they make, you just have the records of everybody's Oyster card or bank card as they touch in and out. And this is supposed to give you a, com a complete data set. Uh, and then I've, I've reverse engineered the word data to give me four words that I think sum up the four key dimensions. Uh, and actually, in fact, the D of data is for dimensions because uh, I, I spoke to a scientist, in fact, who made a, a great distinction between large data and big data. He said large data is, he, he was a, a neuroscientist, he said large data is where I get, instead of 100 brain scans, I get 1,000 brain scans. And that's great. But what's more exciting, he said, is big data, where I may still have a 1,000 brain scans, but I also have a record of those people's medical records, and I have a record of the postcodes where they spent most of their time, and I have a record of the weather over the last 10 years, and I can compare the weather conditions that they, uh, that they enjoyed or didn't enjoy and, uh, and the effect on a particular disease that I'm studying. And it's by putting together those different dimensions that uh, big data offers th these new possibilities. I mean, if you just think of if you've got a smartphone, as most people have, and now turned off, I imagine, uh, that in itself will measure not only who you talk to and how long for, it'll know where you've been, it might know how fast you've been moving, if you have apps on it, it might know your heart rate, it might know what you've bought. It can measure all sorts of different dimensions. Uh, which brings me on to the second, the second key word, the, the, the first A of data is automatic, because so much is automatically gathered. If you have smartphones and apps, they're automatically recording data. If you travel by public transport with a card, it's easier to gather the data than not to gather it. And this throws up all sorts of problems, which I think we will come on to a bit later, but it does mean that it's easier to gather the data than not to now. So it, this stuff is coming in without anybody having decided that it would be really useful to have a particular thing. You just you get it by virtue of living in a digital world. The T of data, I think of as time. Uh, that's partly because it's coming in so fast, you can often use it and analyze it in real time. So you get a sense of things flowing and changing constantly. And that also means that people using big data tend to look forward. They tend to think in terms of prediction, not in terms of let's gather the data and look back over the past and analyze it, but let's build in a system which can predict the future one way or another. Uh, and again, there are various drawbacks to this, which we'll, I hope, discuss in the rest of the session. And the final A, I actually hummed and hard about, but I've come down, I don't think very controversially, with artificial intelligence, because I think this is a new thing about big data, that it doesn't necessarily involve a human being analysing and collecting and judging at every point. With machine learning, you can actually set up a system that will perform analysis without any human being being directly involved, and in some cases without a human being actually understanding what's going on. People who use these systems have said to me, yes, it is to some extent a black box, because I don't know why this machine has spotted these patterns or made these predictions. I don't know the thinking process, if you like, that this machine has gone through. Uh, so that's something where it has removed itself from, from human control. So that's a bit of a lightning introduction, but I hope that throws up some of the reasons why people are excited about it, why it's a potentially immensely powerful tool, but also, I hope, maybe raise some flags about issues that this might raise. Uh, and I know the other speakers are going to cover a lot more ground, so I'll stop. Thank you, Tamandra. Marie, does big data help you save the world uh, in your job? Or does it hinder you, or are either of those claims overstating things? It can do both, definitely. Um, so big data uh, approaches are of huge importance for human and veterinary public health, which uses analysis to identify, treat and prevent disease at the population level as opposed to at the clinical level. 
And our work is about bringing together and synthesising multiple data sources, be they clinical health records, disease surveillance data, climate data, as you mentioned, Tamandra, or phone use data. So big data approaches are about creating structure and preparing data and ideas for projects properly, certainly for our projects, um, to help answer research questions. Um, they involve consideration of biases and weaknesses in the data as a part of that preparation. So I work on several big data projects. The ideas for one, which Sandy alluded to in my introduction, funded by the Natural Environmental Research Council and Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. This is called the Enhanced Infectious Diseases Database. Um, the ideas for that were based on a very heavily used piece of research, which is essentially a list of human pathogens. And it's the most cited paper of one of our most famous epidemiologists in the UK. It took several, year, several people years to, create the, to, to read the scientific literature and other sources to compile, compile this one list of 1,415 pathogens that affect people. Um, but by using open access big data sources, um, for example, the entire taxonomic tree, so everything in nature, DNA and RNA sequences and the metadata behind those sequences, which describe where, when, from which host, um, Pathogen, our pathogens came, we've been able to replicate the original list. Um, we've achieved a more complete end product, which can be regularly updated with new evidence faster and actually semi-automatically as well. By fully mapping the relationships between human and animal diseases, which hasn't, done before, hasn't been done before, their hosts, pathogens, and the transmission routes of disease, we can trace the history of diseases, predict the effects of climate change and other factors like demography and vegetation on pathogens, learn what disease risks exist in a population or region, so undertake very fast risk assessments for any country in the world or an area of a country, and uh, examine how best to tackle diseases, um, we're also able to categorise complex relationships between carriers and hosts, and that's the whole kind of food web, but done for diseases and hosts, including humans and animals. So currently only 4% of clini clinically important human diseases are mapped, and we can improve on that in the future using our database and updating our database. And what we've created is open access, so actually any of you could use it if you had an idea for what you'd like to do. Another big data project I work on, um, the Integrate project, which is actually funded by the Wellcome Trust and Department of Health, is about using different sorts of health records to improve surveillance for gastrointestinal disease in the UK. Um, so this is, for example, connected to chicken with Campylobacter or takeaways with really bad food hygiene. So the idea is we're using anonymous data from NHS 111 and vet surgeries um, and a statistical model to find hotspots of infection, and then we're getting patients reporting gastrointestinal symptoms um, into Public Health England to send us samples, which we investigate new using modern improved laboratory techniques, so we can identify what's causing their illness much faster and hopefully stop outbreaks before they begin. So this is a collaboration between researchers and frontline public health staff, and it's legally bound by ethics and confidentiality agreements including from local organisations, for example, the universities involved have ethics and governance, um, but also NHS sites have the same. We have external panel overseers, so there's an organisation called the Confidential Confidentiality Advisory Group and the NHS uh, Research and Development Offices and Ethics Committees. And this project aims to evolve current gastrointestinal disease surveillance and is in fact an implementation of the improvements we have in various aspects of GI disease care um, these things should be connected to data using whatever methods we can, really. Once we have improved technologies, we actually should be trying to implement them within the NHS system. But it's actually very difficult to do um, in the current environment. So moving on to some developing world examples, the festival theme mentioned projects using mobile phone data in disaster relief situations. And these projects are very new. Um, there are many described using mobile phones in the UN Global Pulse Initiative, um, but the first papers were really published in about 2009 by Andy Tatum and colleagues. Um, and his first study described travel patterns and malaria estimated using mobile phone data. And it was an entirely new concept. In other work from the Flowminder Flow, Flow Foundation, retrospective analysis of the 2010 Haiti earthquake showed that it's possible to accurately estimate the number of displaced people when major population movements occurred and also where people travelled using mobile phone records. 
These estimates were much more accurate than those cobbled together during the outbreak itself, um, just after the earth earthquake happened. And these studies are necessary. We need to have studies where we look back at emergency situations to learn how good what we're doing is so that we can use them properly within a kind of live situation. Finally, in a study from Global Pulse, anonymised called detail records from mobile phones were compared before, during and after a flooding event in Mexico and combined with satellite images, <coughs> rainfall and demographic data. An analysis of records provided a baseline understanding of how affected populations behave in such an emergency, including both their communication and the movements they make, but also how well the disaster recovering during the event could actually be recorded. So how well were the development workers doing in working out what was happening? The research how highlighted how well the call data represented the population structure and what was happening with the population, but also the impact of flooding. And it also indicated that civil protection warnings going out um, during the flooding period weren't working as well as the mobile communications um, that were taking place. So all the projects I've mentioned have been done in peacetime after the event, when they could be properly planned. If we use big data for infectious diseases, ideally this is the right point to make plans and to think about issues, not, unfortunately, during the middle of an outbreak. Thank you, Marie. Um, Paul, do you want to calm us down? Do you want to excite us more? <laughs> uh, where do you want to take us? Yeah, thank you very much for these um, great introductions. Um, and yeah, so I mean, the role that I was assigned to today really was to point out the reasons <coughs> to temper our enthusiasm about big data and development. Um, I have to admit that I myself, as you know, said earlier, I'm very, very enthusiastic about big data. But I do think that it's important to keep in mind the challenges and problems that exist. And therefore, the key points, really, that I'm making now are addressed at voices that proclaim that big data will solve all data gaps that exist in relation to policy making in developing countries, that survey data will no longer be needed, and that it's just a matter of time until all policy makers, nationally and internationally, will be fully informed about all key statistics and indicators that affect their area of activity, and that knowledge will sort of just pour out of big data. I think that this is not the case, and that it will require more than just time and technological change to actually make big data useful, and also that traditionally collected data will remain important. I want to start today by presenting three reasons why I think that this is the case. The first one is governance and access. If we define big data as this on-the-go or unintentionally collected data that is produced by the increasing digitalization of our lives, produced electronically, a lot, we have to see that a lot of this data is proprietary. It's owned by mobile phone companies, by you know, big internet companies, by social networks. And the same also counts for a lot of algorithms that exist out there to deal with this data and to gain in insights from these data. A lot of these are also proprietary. Therefore, if we really want to benefit from big data, a lot of effort will need to be put into, creation, into creating an international setting, an institutional setting, that involves all these key, indi key actors, private and public actors, in the big data world and allows to access data in a very productive way. Of course, this is related to the open data uh, discussion that we have, and a lot of people are already working on this. But I think that as the example, for example, of the Ebola crisis recently has shown where there was initial resistance from mobile phone companies to share uh, CDR records, uh, to use them, uh, we are still quite far away from this. The second reason why I think that big data will not solve all the data gaps is that I think that in the area of international development, so far, robust causal inference with it is difficult. A lot of my work and a lot of the work of my colleagues is focused around the problem of evaluating the effects of public policies. This means answering questions like, what's the impact of a policy program on poverty or on educational outcomes? How well are these policies doing? What intended or unintended, if unintended effects do they have? And one key tool that has been used has been the careful design of policy experiments in the form of randomized controlled trials and related to that purposeful collection of data. Surveys are used for that. And part of these randomized controlled trials are purposefully designed household surveys that collect information from thousands of purposefully sampled households on key indicators for impact assessment. 
the way that programs together with these surveys are designed and implemented allows to draw causal conclusions. I think the key difference to big data here really is this purposeful design and data collection, whereas big data, at least as I would see it right now, is often collected unintentionally and on the go. So making causal claims with such data in this context is a much harder methodological challenge. And I think that carefully designed experiments and data collection are still key for ro robust statements about what works and doesn't work in these contexts. And my last point is really a combination of three other points that are related, that are all related to the fact that it's I cheating. think that we still need surveys to do good statistical work. And that's in particularly related to official statistics in developing countries. First, differential ownerships of mobile phones and internet access can create bias in our estimates. And to deal with that, I think that we will need surveys to compare results in these surveys to what big data tells us and whether big data is really telling us the right thing. The second thing is that a lot of big data methods are, right now are based on training algorithms using survey data. For example, predicting poverty using mobile phone records first needs a poverty survey that can be used to train your big data model. And this model can then be used to make predictions out of this sample, but of course you need a good survey in the beginning to start with. And then the third point is that official statistics work will also always involve trying to say something about characteristics of people that might be quite hard to reach. Digital technology is not available everywhere in the world, and to reach people that are not connected, we still need purposeful data collection, which means doing surveys. Thank you, Paul. David, what are the political and philosophical implications of all of this? Uh, good question. However, <laughs> what I want to talk about is, um, <laughs> is trying to Nicely sort done. of push the difference between data and having more data, whether that's good or bad, and a thing called big data. And I want to say that the potentially really, really exciting, um, not necessarily entirely positive, exciting thing about big data is that it tries to do something really different with knowledge and how we know things. And I think uh, to, to think about that, I'm going to try and explain in my short time why it's different from just having more data. Now, all my three colleagues here have talked about how computing technology, other things, enable us to have more data, take more things out of the world, look at them, go back into history, do more comparisons. That helps us know a lot of things. Fair enough, I'm not saying it doesn't. And then they use words like statistical generation, statistical probabilities, and predictions into the future. And, um, and other stuff, uh, causal influences, data gaps. Now I wanna say that big data often doesn't do any of those things. It can't possibly think about what prediction could be, or what a data, cap could, data gap could be, or what a causal inference could be. Now. Why is that so exciting? It seems mad and crazy. It seems like the abolition of knowledge. Well, that's actually what I want to argue big data promises us. Big data says that what we thought was knowledge actually was non-knowledge. Because in modernist times, we took knowledge out of the world. We extracted it from the world. The world is fluid, multiple, complex, continually moving. But obviously, we couldn't really access the world very well. So we saw a few things here and there and uh, we had these little data, data things, and then we imagined causation and lines and continuities that enabled us to predict things in the future. And what big data says is that that was um, fair enough. You know, when we didn't have technology, when we couldn't know things, maybe we could use our imaginations and construct the world in our fantasy in those ways. But actually, if the world really is complex and fluid, as soon as we take knowledge out of it, it's just going to be not knowledge. Because whatever happened thousands of years in the past with different relationships, that's hardly going to be what's going to happen now. Because you'd have to have a really flat, passive, linear world that just repeated itself all the time for what we call data to be useful. Now, what big data begins to say is that, yeah, technology is important, but how is technology important? It's important because it tries to capture things in their fluidity, in their flow, in their pluralities, in their specificities. Big data tries to drill down to capture the minutiae, not to generalize, generalize upwards into to laws and to abstractions. So how does that help us? Because it's not like knowing, because the whole point of knowing in the past 
was we abstracted the store of knowledge about rules and regularities and causations. We had to take that out of the world. Big data says that actually those will always fail us. And instead of like thinking abstractly about theory, we know it doesn't work. We've been experimenting. Even natural laws, Big Data doesn't say they don't exist. They just say they're not really relevant. Because when two chemicals meet in a specific context, different things happen. Natural laws aren't wrong. They're just not really particularly relevant. Or epigenetics, fair enough, there's DNA. But because of the context of individuals and their environment and all those interactions, the really interesting thing that's about our bodies and diseases and immune systems um, can't, be can't be defined in the abstract like that. So how does it work? Um, say we're looking at refugees or disasters or other things. Big data says that if we can see in the real time, if we can count those things, if, we, if the mobile phones tell us where people are moving, what temperatures people have, how those things are changing, we can actually respond before there's a disaster. Big data tells us that if we go into a disaster area with drones and we take photos and we use machine learning so that we can codify those photos that tell us which buildings have been destroyed, how many refugees there are, which directions they're moving in, we can respond immediately. So that's what it, that's what it does. It doesn't give you causation. It doesn't predict that because refugees went here yesterday, they're going to be going in the same direction in two days' time. That would be ridiculous. So big data is really exciting because what it's saying is that knowledge has to be transformed or possibly even disappear into the world. Now, the only possible problem with that is that we can't think separately from the world anymore. We can't think in terms of transform transformative initiatives. All we're always doing is adapting to the world that exists. But that doesn't mean that big data is not really important and exciting in its own terms. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for our four speakers, please? There's a lot I'd like to ask our speakers after that, but as this is a short slot, I'm going to give you the audience first dibs. Big data is now used in a number of contexts. I'm chairing a session later today on the sustainable development goals. I mean, one of the things kind of people talk regularly uh, with in that context is that the good thing about you know, having uh, unified targets in the world that we might aim to uh, as a broad humanity um, you know, principles and, and things we might want to achieve together, and that we have a new space to do that through the collection of more data and through the, work, the use of that data towards common ends. But I think kind of fundamentally, there is a problematic part uh, of those, but also to some extent, the, the whole of big data gets subsumed by the question, who is big data really helping? I mean, who is it for? Is it for public policy uh, initiatives? Is it kind of rehumanizing, reunifying humanity? Or, you know, in the case of uh, a bunch of new wearable medical technologies, is it to help us um, better police ourselves? I kind of, you know, want to get to the heart of that question, if we can. Hi, um, just picking up on, on David's point, it sounds like you're describing it as more like a big data as a management philosophy. Um, and looking at it in terms of things like sort of, uh, ubiquitous computing in smart cities, get the sense that it's sort of being put forward without any context of values. And I guess there's a question of, do you, have, do you see this as a, as a method to change it in how we actually approach things? And, and where do you see the values coming into this? And whether this is a good thing to be looking at? Because often I think it's put as kind of a positivist approach so that there's not a, an assumption that it has any ideology or values behind it. I don't really understand the point that Dave's making about um, knowledge, uh, because it seems to me that one of the biggest um, difficulties with the whole discussion about big data is what the limits are of human agency and, and human intelligence are, as opposed to machine learning or, um, to Mandra even use the term thinking when it comes to AI. Um, okay, thinking with inverted commas, well, thank God you said that, because I think that's very confusing. The, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is that when you've got big data, nothing has, every single thing that you ask big data will generate statistically significant answers. The question is, how do you judge what those answers actually represent? And I think that's the fundamental problem that I think we, we have with this. I think we, we've got, we, we're living in an age where we are elevating the kind of algorithmic uh, certainties that data can generate for us in a world that's uncertain. And so what I don't understand what David's saying is that I think knowledge comes from us being able to mediate 
that information from experience through, through what we do as human beings and have judgment as to what really that is, is statistically significant or meaningful. I don't think the data does anything. I think the ability for us to capture that, yes, might yield some very new insights, but for that to have any significance, you still require a very basic thing, which is the human ability to adapt to change, to see uncertainty, to look at unpredictability rather than looking for predictability. Thank you. Uh, I might come to you, Timandra. It seems your backronym might be struggling to contain <laughs> some of the ideas we've heard from your fellow panellists and from the audience. Would you like to pick up on anything? Uh, very much so, yes. Lots of, lots of great things raised here, but also those three very important questions. I mean, I think that's exactly it. And in a sense, I think some of the things that David raised about why he's excited about big data are actually some of the things that give me most pause because I think whereas there are lots of practical applications uh, which human beings can use the big data methods to gain new insights and, uh, and tackle big problems uh, in big ways, I think there's a, there's a dark side, if you like, which is a, about the, the positivist legacy and about the idea that Everything, everything can be measured and quantified, and that that in itself will somehow give us the answers without us having to, to, to decide, you know, what are the development goals? What, what should we aspire to as, as a human race? Uh, if we just measure everything, uh, then we can assume that we all want to move in the same direction. So we can assume that if you give people continuous feedback on their behavior, then, then they will all automatically move in the same direction. They'll, they'll take more steps, they'll drink more water, they'll, they'll eat more healthily, they'll have better sleep habits, whatever it is that we assume that we all want. And, and I think that's precisely the problem, really, with the big data approach. Not, not that it represents some kind of evil machine intelligence, but that, you know, in, in a similar way, in fact, to what was raised in the first session of this room, that as our sense of willingness to grapple with moral and political choices recedes, then to look at something, I and mean, especially big data, because it's got the word big in the title, right? So it must be incredibly clever and powerful and the answer to everything. And, and the idea that you harness machine intelligence to come up with answers that human beings wouldn't come up with gives it this kind of godlike status, which which I think is, is, is really problematic. And I think it, it is actually that, I mean, I'm, tr I'm trying to kind of bring this back to the developing world context. Thank you. Because uh, <laughs> we are, we're arranging very freely. I think, in a way, my problem with big data is, is that it's at once too big and not big enough. It's too big in that it's, it flows in to fill this space in us deciding what it is we want to do and what's the purpose. I was really glad that you said, you know, you, you have hypotheses that you want to test and then you, you tackle the data and a similar way to... Um, the, the idea that you need surveys. In fact, you need purposefully to ask questions. So in that sense, I think it's, it's too big for its boots. But in another sense, it's actually not big enough because it's being set to problems that are too small, mostly. I mean, there are fantastic projects where the idea is that you use big data approaches to wipe out malaria forever through better surveying insects and pathogens and, and so forth. And those are the things I think we, we could really embrace. Picking up from that, I mean, Paul, uh, well, sticking to development, we have the question, who is big data for? But actually, I think some of these um, broader themes related very much to what you were saying, particularly about having to collect data purposefully in order to be able to make accurate causal inferences from it. I mean, there's something in what you're saying, isn't there, about how human uh, conscious decision making does and doesn't relate to the uses and, of big data. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the discussion about, you know, what is knowledge and how can we use big data to sort of say something about the world really is really related to that. And I think um, my point earlier was perhaps um, making clear that at least from a policy perspective in developing countries, um, I do think that we need at least the people that we interact with, you know, policymakers in developing countries, they do, and, and I mean, in any country, they do need to have a sense about whether what they are planning to do makes sense. I mean, whether their intended effects on, you know, whatever it is, public health or so, will actually materialize or not. And that's, a, mm -hmm. I mean, a very clear 
sort of causal question that you need to answer and you need to find ways to do that. And I think there are ways of using big data for that as well. I mean, there are method methodology methodologies to do that. But I also think that traditional ways of answering these questions are actually quite powerful. And that's why, I, as I said earlier, I think that they still play a role. And this is related to the question, the first question that we had about the sustainable development goals about who is you know, big data for. Um, there's a lot of uh, excitement about big data related to the sustainable development goals and related to the idea that we can't, a lot of things we can't measure right now. We don't know a lot about important indicators in many countries just because there is no data about that. And people say, well, big data might be able to fill these gaps, right? But I actually, and you know, I actually think, and a lot of people are also working on that, is that traditional statistical work can help a lot to improve that. And that means uh, channeling official development assistance into national statistics offices, right? Improve capacity there, improve capacity even in like traditional ways of data collection to be able to say something about uh, things like child mortality and you know pregnancy of young women and things like that. I mean, there are ways to address that without necessarily thinking about big data, right? And, um, and then the question about who is big data for and what are like the ethical ideas behind that, I think relate to this normal or traditional data collection as well. I mean, this is not a new question. It's not the first time that we are saying we are measuring what people are doing. I mean, this is what we've been doing for, you know, centuries. And, um, and these questions have always been important, and, you know, privacy has been an issue, and there have been ethical considerations. So, of course, big data is different, and it's, we are looking at different types of data, different methodologies. There are different ways of dealing with that. But I don't think that this is something that is completely new, and I do think that we can, you know, sort of continue the conversation and need to continue the conversation um, that we have been having for a long while already. Maria, I'll let you pick up from there, and, you know, is there anything new under the sun, and so on. Um, and just one thing I wanted to mention, you know, these, these bigger themes that are being discussed of what role humans play in relation to data or do not, passive or active. You know, you mentioned being able to uh, um, explore the entire taxonomic tree. It occurred to me, well, that's fantastic. You could do that with a machine, but of course the taxons were invented by humans. We categorise them using, using our uh, invented categories. Um, isn't that interesting? Yes. Um, <laughs> frankly, um, and and when we're developing something that uses uh, looks at something like the taxonomic tree, you always want to future proof it so that if you think of a new way to do something, or somebody suddenly says, "Right, we're not looking at this taxonomy anymore; we've changed it completely," that we can actually restructure and think about things in a different way mm -hmm. and make comparisons. So, in the in the work that we've done, it's been all about making sure that we're creating something for the future that can be used in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we want things, we, we need data to test against. And I think some of the, the comments about where do the values come in with big data. Yes. For, for us, in terms of epidemiology and public health, you're using it as a part of the process. And it's a process that, you know, public health has been around for a long time and we're beginning to bring new approaches in, but we're always, always testing back against what we know all the time. We don't go at something from a completely different dimension straight away. There's always a kind of grounding to it, particularly if you're talking about human disease stuff. I think you can judge to a certain degree what the right answers are by using model uh, data from, from before. You have to have data to test what you're doing against, mm -hmm. um, as Paul said earlier on. And that's very, very important. Because otherwise, yes, it, the sky would be the limit, and it might be a limit, yeah. We need a ceiling. <laughs> I'll let you clarify very quickly, Dave, what you were talking about, um, because it's come in for some questioning from the audience. I mean, you seem to me to be saying that data is exciting because it asks, it poses a question or a, a difficult question that we have to live up to. You know, it, it, puts a, it gives us a challenge that we don't really recognise. If we recognised it, we'd have something to live up to. Um, that we're not doing at the moment. Have I got that right, or have your critics got that? Well, I think not understanding is not the same as criticising. So I was trying to make the point that big data is doing something from old-fashioned data. Old-fashioned data has algorithms that tell us solutions to things from statistical probabilities and stuff. Fine. All I was saying was that big data doesn't work like that. It tries to see the world. It doesn't answer anything. It tries to appreciate the world in its plurality. Now, obviously, it's not doing it. We're doing it. How is big data driven? Not by technology, 
but by knowledge cynicism and understanding that having knowledge in universities or big theories and being really clever has got nothing to do with the complex reality of a world. In fact, it will probably make things worse. We're driving big data, so we don't even need computers. And we've always had algorithms from the ancient Greeks. I mean, it's a ridiculous thing. The only way that the, the only it might be useful to think about how do algorithms work differently. So in the drone example where I said, where algorithms aren't giving an answer, they're just trying to datify to see things in their emergence, you use a machine learning algorithm so that the machine can immediately begin to identify how many refugees they are. You know, through like, these are the pixels like this and all the rest of it. Now that might be an algorithm, but, and, but, but its, perp its, its way of being used is to try and see things in real time because we have a belief that knowledge that isn't real time, knowledge that isn't fluid, knowledge that isn't plural, isn't so useful anymore. Now the whole of modernity was based on the opposite of that belief. Now that's why to me it's exciting. And there's no point in just saying, oh, I don't believe it because it's there in the world all the time. And the excitement in the world about big data is the imaginary that it overcomes the problems with old types of knowledge. Now, I'm not advocating it, but I'm just saying we should take it seriously. Otherwise, we'd be putting our heads in the sand like ostriches or whatever, which wouldn't be useful. OK. Yeah, I'm really glad that chap at the back made the um, point. He made it much better than I would have said it. That's about the point about um, thinking with artificial intelligence and human beings making judgments. I just want to address Paul your sort of sphere of working with uh, looking at uh, problem solving in things like poverty and in education. Um, I used to work in, in lo local authorities in Quangos where we would uh, pull together data, well, not I wouldn't call it data, we'd pull together findings. Um, and the reason why these findings had been generated was for uh, central government to monitor performance so quite often I mean I think I worked in public the public uh, public sector for about 15 years and it's like for 15 years they would produce a report and say oh well we didn't have the right data so the, the reason why it was being they you know people were collecting this information to be held to account central government and but it actually it was useless so that's my first point sec I mean just to, I remember big data being the way it's being described and the plurality of it is it re really came to a fault to me like 10 years ago when I put uh, geographical information uh, together and you could see from a range of different disciplines, education, health, blah, 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 uh, things from different perspectives. But it really was where you had to, you know, so things wouldn't make be clear on a spreadsheet, but if you visualise it onto a map, and you would put a range of different people from different dis disciplines, education, health, etc. They could see they could see things together mm -hmm. and formulate solutions when it's all in front of them. But the human judgment was is the individuals who had the knowledge of those particular problems that they were dealing with the population who would then formulate a solution based on that. So it was I I see big data as you have the information in front of you and then you judge and you. If, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So my question is uh, really about the point raised by Paul when he pointed out the one limitation of big data currently is that it's proprietary in many cases, is the data is owned by companies, whether it's network operators or social network co companies or internet search companies, and also the algorithms are owned by them. So as you may know, there is the notion in the artificial intelligence community, deep learning community, that ultimately there's just going to be a single algorithm. This single algorithm is going to figure out a uh, is a generalization of all the other learning algorithms. And you can read about it in the new book by the professor from Seattle, uh, Petro Domingo, mm -hmm. the master algorithm. So I mean, are you worried that the algorithms are going to be held up but because it's just inside Google's knowledge or just inside somebody else's? And uh, do you buy into this idea that there will be a single algorithm, which, by the way, can also infer categorization? Something currently, it is humans who often put in the categorization, put in the taxonomies, but these algorithms, especially the unsupervised deep learnings, they infer the categorization and taxonomies by themselves, which often come up with things we hadn't thought of. And then we look at them and we say, actually, that's an interesting way of breaking things up, and maybe this is a better taxonomy. But then, if Quickly. the algorithms are uh, public, what about getting the data out of the hands of these companies who uh, are very proprietary? How can we persuade them to do that? Now, I found, found it very interesting, because uh, you made a very fundamental 
because you sort of had this wonderful gesture of faith tomorrow when you brought up your phone and you said it said all of these things about you, mm -hmm. you know, heart rate and what the information is and what messages you're getting, when actually it doesn't. It doesn't say anything about you. It's just yeah. saying what it's saying. I think the problem with this entire panel is you're all assuming that big data is big reality, and it just isn't. I mean, the world is big data, and I think... I mean, what I've learned from the panel is if there's a disaster, what I need to do is get 50 of these phones together, pretend that there are 100, of, 100 people in a, a basement somewhere, and I'm the first person to get saved. <laughs> I kind of feel like, you know, you're... Please making, don't take that away. You're making this, <laughs> you're making Today's this debate. fundamental assumption. And, you know, you come to David, I think, David's point about... Yes. I mean, no, it isn't. I mean, data is information. I mean, and this is manipulatable, and it will be manipulated. I mean, I've just talked about one ridiculous application. I mean, we're talking about proprietary, but why should this data be real? I mean, at least surveyable data is real. Okay. Um, just my background, I've lived in um, Zambia and South Africa for a large part of my life. Mm -hmm. So looking at it from a developing country's point of view, I think big data is, isn't the way to solve problems right now. I'd agree with Paul where primary sources of collecting surveys um, helps things more because at the end of the day, we're humans and we are gathering information and connecting dots from there onwards. Whereas a lot of the times, the big data, the way we get it is consistency of technology. And in the developing countries, it's not consistent right now. Um, and for me, that feels like we should put more emphasis on, on the people who are, who are closest to the primary source of data rather than the actual technology which collects the big data because it's not consistent right now. How do you know it's reliable? How do you know you can trust it? I'd be interested in hearing about some practical examples of this. The question of the debate is, can big data save the world? Can any of you inform us about attempts to have done so, successful otherwise, that we see in the real world? I've heard about your pathogen mapping, but I'd be interested to hear about others because I don't know much about it. I think a lot of this will depend on the digital strategy of the country in question. And I think for the developing world, there is a real opportunity um, in that there's not much legacy technology there in the first place. One of the problems we have in the UK here, particularly in the, the application of technology and big data in government, is that um, the organisations are quite siloed. They have different standards by which they treat the data, uh, playing to the point about propri proprietary standards as well. Um, but this wouldn't necessarily be the case in a lot of the developing countries. Um, for example, here in the UK, um, police, the, we have 43 police forces, 46 fire and, service, uh, fire and rescue services, and 11 uh, ambulance trusts, um, all of whom have developed you know, different legacy technologies that don't speak to one another. Um, but I think in the developing world, this, this could be remedied, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a lot on the table there, ranging from examples people have given or examples people are requesting of big data being able to save the world in the developing, the developing world or, or the world in general. We have some more abstract quite philosophical questions that, you know, is the, da is the data real? And if so, in what sense? There's a sort of map in the territory uh, type uh, question there. Um, and I'm very interested in this idea of categories being generated uh, by algorithms. I, I must admit, I have some nervousness about that, not just in relation to taxonomy, but in relation to psychiatric nosology, to cite another field where it's being used, you know, the creation of categories of psychiatric disease, um, which is a very contested field. And I, I have some reservations about what might happen if we give that over to, uh, uh, to data to drive the creation of those categories. But perhaps I'm worrying too much. So all those things are on the table. I'm going to ask our speakers to do an impossible task. I'm going to ask them to pick up on anything that's been uh, mentioned, including, including things I've just mentioned, and also offer a concluding thought. And I'm going to ask them to do it in a couple of minutes each. And I'm going to ask them to do it in uh, reverse order of the order in which they originally spoke. So I'm going to start uh, with you, David. Cool. Big data, I would suggest, doesn't solve problems because it doesn't operate in a world where there's normality, there's a problem, we solve it, we go back. Big data, I'm not advocating for it, I'm just saying uh, it tries to work on seeing things fluidly in emergence. So take one concrete example. I'm not saying it solves co conflict, but big data sees conflict in its emergence. It doesn't wait until there's been a genocide, then think, what do we do? It says, 
that we can datify relationships, i.e. see things. The big data numbers are not like modernist numbers that count things and add them up and all the rest of it. They're like Lego creative numbers. They're just signifying things and their relationships. So, so what big data people say is that you can see conflict in its emergence through text messages and other things that people do on their phones. People say, those people are taking our land, they've done this, they're, they're doing this to our rights. And then that conflict in its emergence has a datified trail. And then other people, NGOs, can then do SMS text messages, messages saying, no, these people aren't doing that, or we should think differently, or you should do this. So rather than normality, conflict, uh, back to normality, big data says conflict is always going to be in the world. We just don't see it. We are always waiting until there's been an earthquake, a disaster, a genocide. What we need to do is think about how we see things in their emergence, and technology can't help us datify the world to see things that we couldn't see. You know, but you don't have to have a computer. I've datified my Rizla packets where I have two papers, how to use it equally through an algorithm, where if they point this way, I do that, and if they point the other way, I do that. I'm just seeing it differently. I'm not doing causation or I'm not doing any big understanding. Big data is just seeing differently. Now, obviously, that's not a solution to problems, but it's a different way of approaching them. That's, that's all. OK, thank you. Um, Paul, what do you make of all that? <laughs> I think I, I want to reply to two things. I think uh, one of the topics that were in all of the questions right in the last round of questions was about whether big data is useful. Is it you know, big reality? Does it tell us really something? And it's perhaps related to what they've just said as well. So my pers perspective on this really is that the same sort of scrutiny that you would have with traditional forms of data should apply to big data. Right? You should think about whether the data you're looking at actually does tell you something about reality or not. Is it useful? Well, you know, let's see where it comes from. Let's check what is producing it. Let's do some quality checks and like apply the same scrutiny that you would apply to other data sources to say whether this is actually telling you the right thing that you want to analyze, right? And I, and I agree. I mean, then things like on-the-go analysis and uh, seeing things in real life can actually happen and can be very useful, but you need to be aware of the fact that just because this data is produced automatically, it doesn't mean that it really is the correct thing that you are looking at, right? You need to look into where it comes from and how it's being produced. So I think this is really useful, and the same applies to trad traditional forms of data collection, of course. Uh, and that's, you know, of course you should try to collect and present the data that is useful for the purpose that you are trying to use it. And the other question that I just wanted to quickly, um, other topic was about, um, to how to persuade companies to sort of open up their, you know, their data and their algorithms. And I think, of course, this is a, you know, a very fundamental problem and a big you know, discussion that would probably be in a different panel. Uh, ju I just want to make clear that I think that a lot of people are actually already working on it. Universities in the US at MIT, for example, people are thinking about legal structures um, new forms of contracts that can give people ownership over their own data and uh, can allow to sort of um, give access to certain companies or certain um, uh, tools on their mobile phones in a very specific way. So I think there are already emerging ways of thinking about this in a modern legal framework that will allow to make use of this data in a, uh, for the public good. Thank you, Paul. Um, Marie, what are your closing thoughts? Um, the comment about surveys being real, I think, is really important. And discussing this with a colleague beforehand who also uses big data approaches, we have to have information to ground what we're doing in terms of asking questions. We have to have proper surveys originally. So we do need more money spent on statistical offices and on finding out where things are actually happening. Um, and that's something that really needs to be emphasised. Big data is not ever going to be a solution on its own because we always have to ground it back into the problem that we know is there. We have to have that basic information. Um, they can't solve any problem, every problem, particularly in a crisis. Their strength is in being used in tandem with other disciplines. So in, um, in epidemiology... In public health, we need clinicians, we need laboratory staff, we need number crunchers, epidemiologists, we need public health specialists. Everybody helps solve a problem. And it's not just one person running a few automatic anything. You know, it's all always being part of a team. And that's the way, for, certainly for the work that I'm working on, in which big data can really help. Tim Andra. Uh, I don't really disagree with a lot that Paul and Marie have said. 
I've been to America to do some research and talk to a lot of big data people. And there was one meeting that really struck in my mind that, again, you may think odd. Um, I was talking to somebody working for a big data company that did use um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And he, he told me his background was that he traveled the world a lot uh, in his youth because his father worked for the CIA. And that the reason he now worked for a big data company was two things. It was that uh, he had written his undergraduate dissertation about the emergence of uh, jihadi fundamentalists in the Maghreb. And this was in the 1990s, so this was the immediate aftermath of the Cold War. And it was about trying to predict conflict there. Uh, and that his mother was interested in art history, and he loved pointillism, and he loved the fact that you had to step back from a painting to see patterns emerge. And for him, this summed up why he wanted to work in big data. It was the it was the looking for patterns and it was predicting things before they happened. And I thought that was very telling because I think it, it's a very fundamental human drive, but I think also the fact that it came out of a time in history where you couldn't actually easily look at the political realities of the world and say, we can see where this conflict is coming from. It was very difficult to see why things were happening. It was very difficult to predict things that were going to happen. And the appeal that if you get a clever enough machine and enough information points which are being collected automatically, uh, obviously, no matter how many dimensions of my life you capture in data, that's not my life. That's just measuring it from a lot of different angles. Uh, but this idea that if you did that, if you measured enough different angles and you got a clever enough machine, that that could control and predict the future, I think is very seductive. Seductive and wrong. Uh, so can big data save the world? No, it could be doing a lot more, a lot more than it is. It's got potential uses in agriculture, uh, obviously in, in medicine, disease eradication, uh, in, uh, in enabling economic activity, in oil and gas. There's, there's any number of examples where it could be doing a lot more than it is. It tends to be about doing the same with less. It tends to be about doing the same things more efficiently. Uh, which is the last thing the developing world needs. The developing world needs to do more with more. I'd like to thank the Wellcome Trust again for supporting this strand, and I'd like to invite you to please thank our excellent panel of speakers. <laughs>